Hello everyone, this is, uh, this is a great opportunity that we have today. I'm here with Bernie Hunoff and his daughter Katie Hunoff, and we're talking about South Dakota Magazine, the biggest publication in South Dakota. So welcome to the show. Uh, Bernie, you're the editor at large and you started uh, South Dakota Magazine back in 1985, right? That's right. My, my, my wife Myrna and I started it in 1985. We'd been in the weekly newspaper business and done some other things and we just uh, just wanted to, we wanted to stay in South Dakota, we wanted to stay in publishing and we just uh, realized that most states had some kind of a state magazine like this and South Dakota had some in the past, uh, didn't have any at the time and we thought mm -hmm. maybe it was an opportunity to show off the state we love. Well, it's a great magazine. I've got the, uh, you know, the most current issue and you talk about, um, you're talking about, you know, ranchers flying, you know, over their cattle mm -hmm. and landing, you know, in muddy parts of the, of the, the river and yeah. getting stuck and yeah. through snowstorms. And then you're talking about, you know, the Dakota theater too. Mm -hmm. So it's a really diverse, you know, way to bring South Dakota to people. And that's what's, that, that's one of the beauties of South Dakota is that very diversity. We, we, you know, we have nine Indian reservations. We've got West River and East River. We've got mountains, lakes, prairies, and even badlands, almost like desert country. So we've got such geographic diversity and cultural diversity. I mean, that's what makes it fun. There's n n no shortage of all, all sorts of topics and in, 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 in the diversity still amazes me after 40 years. Take me back, Bernie, a little bit to, um, you grew up on a farm, right? Uh, yes, uh, close. North, just north of Yankton. Okay, and then so you've been in Yankton most of your life. Mm -hmm. That's right. And was was this something that you wanted to do? Uh, I know you graduated from Mount Marty College. Was this something that you wanted to do or had in your mind from you know way back? No, like most young people, you know, I was just trying to pay the bills and try to find something that I enjoy doing. And I grew up on a farm with, with uh, there were seven, seven boys. We grew up together on a farm. And I, we loved farming. We, I think all of us would have been farmers, except Dad, Dad we, it was a pretty small farm and, and uh, not enough for all of us, or, or even for one of us, really. So, so we all kind of went off into town to get jobs or start businesses. And I got into the um, newspaper business. I was in politics a little bit right out of college, and then I got into the newspaper business. And I liked that. And I started a little weekly newspaper, The Observer, which is still being published here in Yankton. Right, right. And I had a, a, just a kind of a fluke deal. There was a guy running around the country who was buying up little community newspapers. And I, we had a chance to just kind of cash in. And I, and I could see that running a little newspaper in a little town was um, probably going to be a tough way to go for a long time. You know, not a way to get rich. Neither is a magazine for that matter, <laughs> but, but, it, but I can see it was pretty tough and somebody came along one day and wanted to buy it and I said, yeah, it's yours. You know, we didn't take long to figure that out. And uh, so we had a little bit of money and at that point we looked around thinking, I, I thought maybe we'd go to another state and, and buy a bigger newspaper that, that would be a little more viable. And uh, we, we, my wife and I took, took uh, road trips into Colorado, Nebraska, uh, some other states. And it sounds corny, but you know, we, we didn't really find a place that we really felt as good about as South Dakota. And, and, and we more and more decided we wanted to do something in South Dakota. And we, I decided to no compete. As a businessman, you would appreciate this. I decided to no compete that I would not be in the newspaper business for 10 years. But the no <laughs> compete didn't say anything about magazines. <laughs> so so I, uh, I got to exploring that. That uh, and, and the lawyers said, yeah, you can start a magazine if you want. They said, we should have put that in the no compete, but we didn't. <laughs> and um, we explored that and, and we just thought that sounded like, a, for one thing, fun. And secondly, something that would be good for South Dakota. And it really grew out of that. Good, good. Katie, do you know, um, what's the story behind West River and East River? Because I came from like 200 miles south in, in uh, Nebraska. <laughs> Um, you know, I don't know where it started, but I feel like we did do a story once. Do you remember that story we had on a guy who, kind of from an outsider point of view, wrote what he considered to be the differences between, and he said that there was three different parts of the state, East River, West River, and the reservations, um, and kind of talked about their local color for each of them. And I think it comes from, you know, people wanting 
like identifying in that way like okay i'm from east river this is you know th these are my roots um i think the guy in the story even said okay people east river um drink their coffee with milk people west river drink it black <laughs> so i don't know if that's true but um i think it just goes i think we all identify as south dakotans but then even further we also do identify as e as being born West River, East River, and that's a part of our identity as South Dakotans as well. Well, and you bring up, uh, you know, identifying as a South Dakotan. Mm -hmm. And when I came up here to, to Yankton College from Nebraska, there's like a, to me, it was like a feeling or I don't know how to describe it, but it seems like almost everybody in South Dakota is connected. Do you have anything to add to no, that? And back to the river, you know, there was a time when, when the Missouri River did divide us more just because it's, it's one of the North America's biggest, longest rivers. And it was a, it was a geographic, a natural barrier that mm. people could not easily cross. So at one time it, it was a bigger barrier culturally and in every way. But, I, I, but today I think people are proud of East River and West River. There are a lot of West River kids who grew up on ranches and cowboys and ended up being bankers in Sioux Falls, you know, and there are a lot of uh, people who grew up around Sioux Falls, Yankton, Mitchell, East River, who have cabins in the Black Hills now, or go uh, elk hunt, or go uh, antelope hunting or deer hunting mm -hmm. in the West River. So I think as Katie said, we're all one big state, and, 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 and while at one time there was more of an East River, West River division just based on geography, now it's, it's like people are proud of East River and West River and everything in between, and, and especially the Missouri River. And, and, and now what used to divide us now actually unites us and brings us together. Well, I was never used to, like where I live, like driving clear out to Scott's Bluff for a basketball game because we just did not, not play mm -hmm. those people out there in the Nebraska panhandle. Mm -hmm. But it's nothing for people in Sioux Falls just to, to head off to Rapid yep. City and they just jump in their car and go. Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a short trip. Thanks, yeah. in, <laughs> thanks in part to the interstate highway system of today, but yeah. <laughs> I've read things where both of you are talking like a sense of place, you know, and you started uh, Muddy Mo's, the coffee shop downtown, to get people together, to connect, to get this sense of place. So how do each of you describe that? You just described yeah, it Yeah, you did well. a really right. good job. Thank <laughs> right. you. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how to... Thanks for up the coffee shop because that's a good example. And even within that small space in the coffee shop, people from all over the state um, like reunite and um, introduce themselves to us and our magazine readers. So, so that's a really cool part of having the coffee shop. So Katie, like for people that have never seen the magazine, or you know viewed as you know you've got great photography and everything i think the the photography is worth you know the money you pay for the magazine actually but not to say that the articles aren't great either yeah. but you have such great photography what what would you how would you describe what the magazine is i would say it's a, a just a really honest look at what it's like to live in south dakota now and, um, and yeah, we, we fr frequently have historical articles, but we tie them into present day life too. And also um, a lot of people tell us that they use the magazine to plan their own vacations, their own trips around South Dakota. And so I, I, would, I would tell somebody who had never heard of the magazine before that, that it's just a, a glimpse into what it's like to be a South Dakotan and to live here. But also, you know, it, we do talk about all of our roots and where we came from as well. Okay. And the photography, I feel like it's, you know, um, when I first started, it wasn't that great, was it, Dad? No. Nope. Um, but, but, you know, the digital photography has um, just really improved over the years. And also, I think even more so, printed capabilities have improved. So, um, so yeah, so now there's this really beautiful, glossy color magazines. And I think we're proud that we offer what we think of as like a world-class magazine for the people of South Dakota. Um, we think that South Dakotans deserve that and not every state has it. So we're happy that, um, that we're doing it here. And the photography is kind of like a, a group effort. Um, a lot of the people in the office here are photographers, including like our advertising gal that sells advertising. She's a photographer. 
Um, my dad is, I think, a, one of the best photographers in the state at taking photos of people um, and, and capturing like a person, like doing what they love, for example. Um, I'm trying to think. Katie's being too modest though, because oh, when, when she started about 20 years ago, the, the <laughs> photography was probably just average. And when Katie came, she said, you know, we're going to have the best photography of any magazine. Yeah. And, and she went out and, and uh, is a, when, uh, she's, young, she's still young, as a young girl, she went out and met and, and, um, and, and recruited some of the very best photographers all over the state to help us out with that. And, and there, many of them, all of them probably are still working with us today. Paul Horstead and Johnny Sunby and Greg Lotza and Christian Begeman, and we shouldn't start names, but now I did already, I guess, and numerous others. And the best is working for us now. Yeah, and Chad Koppus is, uh, is, is actually on our staff now working out of here. So really, really great photographers who all bought into the idea that we live in a really special place here full of natural beauty and let's show it off, not in a false way, because some magazines, you look yeah. at the magazine and then you go visit that place and it doesn't even look like that. Yeah. That's not what we do here. Uh, Katie touched on that too. We really try to show an honest look at what South Dakota is all about. Yeah, it's like being there. Yeah, it is. I'm glad to hear you say that because that's what we want. Yeah, it's like being there. This Christmas, uh, Kay's dad, uh, Paul Logan, he lives in Mitchell and we got him a subscription and he's okay. had subscriptions before. Mm -hmm. But I know one of the things that he, the, the, his favorite thing that he likes about your magazine are the articles about the small towns. And the small towns, it seems like even the smallest town, is, they're so strong in South Dakota. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have like 300 of those, what we'd call 300 towns and cities in South Dakota. And, and let's face it, about 290 of them are small towns. <laughs> really, yeah. really wonderful little places. And, you know, we never have, we, we do a lot of stories on Sioux Falls and Rapid City and Aberdeen, the biggest cities. But nobody ever says, I want you to do more stories on Sioux Falls or Rapid City or Aberdeen. They always say, yeah, oh, could you go do a story on Went or, you know, or, or on Clear Lake or on the, all these, because all South Dakotans, whether they're urban or rural, love the charm of our small towns because they are different than towns anywhere else. Our bigger cities, let's face it, they're starting to all look a little bit the same yeah. with all the chain stores and everything. Our small towns still have originality and character and, and you bet our readers and I think people as a whole just love those small towns. Well, Kay's dad's from a small town from Agar. Mm -hmm. That's where she yep, grew up. Written about that. And, uh, you know, he knows a lot about small towns, but he says, when I read these articles, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. So how do you find your stories? How do you, do you have like a list or do you just start, you know, take off in a van and go, let's just go into this area and see what's there? Well, a lot of times readers will help us with story ideas. Like, for example, let's do a story on agar. Um, and then I think part of the reason the small towns are so popular is because like, just like in any city, you know, I think people would have, everybody has a story to tell. So when Chad, for example, he writes our, our tiny town features, he'll go into a town and, and just spend time there and talk to the people. And everybody does have a story. And I think he just takes the time to, to get to know what it is. And we like sharing that story because then when our readers go into that town, they have a new way of looking at the town. They'll know things about it they wouldn't know otherwise even feel like they know, like the proprietors of the bar, if they can right. visit the bar. Um, and I think that's why it's different, because we take the time. Um, we don't do like fast journalism, I guess, and, and we just take the time to get to know people and, um, and try to give like a really accurate representation of that town and not just like a, a quick glimpse of it. And a big key, and Chad does this so well, a big key is not to just show up and go talk to the Chamber of Commerce director or the state senator, mm -hmm. because they're usually Nothing against. We love state senators and mayors and chamber of commerce directors. They're all great people, but you know they, they've got something to sell, and they're not. And, and the best thing is just to go sit in a place like Muddy Mo's if you can yeah. find a place and just sit yeah. and hang around and, and meet the people and try to get it, try to get your pulse on the town. And then to get out of your car, which all travelers should do, get out of your car and just go walk up and down the streets because you see a place totally different on foot than you do from behind the windshield. Yeah, and people from South Dakota, they'll talk to you. Oh, yeah. So I know you were a representative two different times in your mm -hmm. life. That's right. Uh, you ran for governor mm -hmm. in 1998. That's right. Is that right? You did your research. And, and, you, and you won, actually, the Democratic. Mm -hmm. That's right. Right. Um, 
and you're in the, the South Dakota Hall of Fame That's for right. arts and entertainment. You've been doing all the boring research, yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you helped Katie, I, I know, with uh, you know, opening Muddy Moe's Coffee House. And uh, so, so what's the next big thing for Bernie? That's what I want to know. What, what are you, up to like now, what's been the, the, the best like feel good thing that you've done and what are you going to do or what do you want to do in the future? Well, for Myrna and I, the, by far and away, the biggest thing is well, we've raised two great kids, Katie and, yeah. and her brother Chris, who runs uh, the axe throwing bar, the boathouse here in Yankton. It's an axe throwing bar. I'm, I'm getting pretty good at throwing axes, so maybe I'll take that up as a professional. <laughs> no, probably he not. He's really good at it. <laughs> probably not. But uh, no, uh, you know, um, j just the, the, the family is, is, when you get to my age, the family and the community right here are, are what's really important. And Katie still lets me hang out here at the magazine, so I, I still do quite a bit of writing, maybe more than ever, because Katie's doing the business end, and I've got yeah, a little you have more time. time and fewer distractions, so I'm actually I, I'm probably doing as much writing as I've done in quite a while right now. So I think just more of the same. It's our 50th wedding anniversary, so we are planning a big 50th anniversary trip that my wife is planning right now. We'll do that this summer, but so that's the next big thing. But, but after that, I think just more of uh, exploring South Dakota and enjoying family in South Dakota. Okay, one more question for each of you, and it's the same question. Uh, you know, I, I have a, a story in Yankton that just intrigues me, and you know about it, is Jack mm -hmm. McCall. Yep. And I did a video mm -hmm. on the history mm -hmm. of Jack McCall. And Very well done, I saw that. The viewers can, you know, look at that on our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And you helped me with that. You had the, the serving tray from a yes, bar yes. downtown from that era. Right around the corner. Yeah. And you talked about a length of rope that still mm -hmm. existed. Mm -hmm. and yes, right. I mean, stuff that gives you goosebumps, right, you know? Right, exactly. But what's your, that's my favorite story, you know, that just keeps coming back. Like, do, you, do each of you have like a story that you go, well, you know, in five years, I'm going to like check out what happened with that or what, what story is it that? Is there a story like that? Well, for me, and, and, and readers have favorite stories, and it's interesting. Uh, it's always interesting to us what, what story captures the readers' attentions. That's a whole other question. For me, the, the story that, <clears throat> that I've really enjoyed following and working on was a story about Black Elk. Black Elk was a spiritual leader of the Lakota who, uh, as he was a child at, at the Battle of Little Bighorn, actually was told to take scalps by older warriors. And uh, he was at Wounded Knee, at the Wounded Knee Massacre. He went with Wild Bill Hickok, or with Buffalo Bill on the Wild West show to Europe. So he had amazing experiences as a young man. He also had a vision that he was to be a healer. And he became a spiritual leader of the Lakota. And then he became a Christian slash Lakota spiritual healer. And uh, the church that he grew up, Katie said, you know, we, we like to tie history to what's happening today. Black Elk is a great example. Black Elk uh, built a church on, in Manderson on the Pine Ridge Reservation, one of the poorest places in the United States. And yet some of the most beautiful people are there, and many of them, a third of them, are his direct descendants. Hmm. And Black Elk is now being uh, considered for sainthood in the Catholic Church. That's how, how much of a spiritual leader he's been, both to Lakota and the Christians. And we recently did a big story about what Black Elk's community looks like today and what impact he's made on South Dakota. And, and so that'll be, that's, that's going to continue because the Catholic Church is going to continue to consider him as a saint. And uh, it's, it's something I think we all should should pay attention to and learn more about. And Katie, what's your story? <laughs> um, I think I might need my dad to help me with some of the details on this, but I think um, this is a really, really telling of like what our readers look for and uh, like what we would call our best stories. But the story about Ray Deloria, and you know, this is a, a sports story, um, a basketball story about how an underdog team kind of rose to victory. And um, Ray Deloria was the star on this particular day, but in his own life, he wasn't a star. He, you know, was an underdog, um, you know, born with almost everything against him, already faced alcohol problems even in high school. And the story also, am I right on track yeah, so far? Right on. And the story also is about the coach. Um, Q QC Miles. These, they, yep, so these are, this was a Native American team with, with white kids. The coach was white. The coach also struggled with his own problems with alcohol. This was written by the coach's son, um, and it's just a, a really beautiful story. Um, I think because it's so honest and raw, with people being really a lot of honesty about people's hardships, 
which a lot of times I think in rural South Dakota, people try to hide um, from their neighbors, they're embarrassed of their problems. But this story just really got to the heart of what it is to be a human and to have regular struggles and like a beautiful glimpse of one time when they rose above them. Mm -hmm. That happened in, in Gann Valley in Buffalo County. Okay. It, quite a, it should, be a, should be a movie. It's, an, it's just an amazing story of, uh, like Katie says, of resilience in South Dakota in overcoming, you know, just a really tough time. The coach, QC Miles, who just died a couple years ago, QC Miles came out of world, came back from World War II with what today we know to be PTSD, but uh, they just thought he was a drunk, you know, he, he couldn't come to grips with what he'd faced in World War II. So he was a young teacher and coach and couldn't get a job anywhere. He got a job at Gann Valley at this tiny, tiny little place that had a mix of Indian and white students in the, in the 50s when there was a, Still too much racism today. There was a lot of racism in the 1950s, and he had to bring the white students and Indian students together. They hadn't won a basketball game in I don't know how many years now. Many, many never. years. That they were, you know, Maybe never. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, he, uh, he 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 got the whole community together, got the team together, and took him to the state tournament. Wow. So it's a great story. Wow. So did he win the state? No, no. And, and there was a story there too. It didn't. It, you know, it's not a perfect ending, but it's. Um, I think they, they had some issues at the state tournament. Uh, they won a couple of games. I think they, I think they might have got third. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you both for you know sitting down with me. It's such a great um, magazine, and uh, we always like doing uh, you know videos about Yankton or the area of people that you know want to move here or just you know people from around here that just don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, so Katie, could you tell um, our viewers, like if they want to get a subscription, uh, like where should they go? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we're here at 410 East 3rd Street in Yankton. We love it when people walk in and we do have a, we do give tours of our historical office building, which is the home of Territorial Governor John Pennington. And also we do have a website, luckily we're um, not too far behind the times. It's SouthDakotaMagazine.com, and you can also call anytime to our, we have a 1-800 number. Those are getting a little bit outdated, I guess, now that I mention it. We have a 1-800 number, but also just find us on Google. Well, thank you both, and we'll see you at Muddy Mo's. Hey, pleasure. Thanks so much, Scott. We really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, thank you're, you. You're so good at this. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.